Last night I, uh, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me about the verse on your banner. <laughs> um, Matthew 11 verse 12. And this, what I'm about to share out of this actually kind of follows on from what I've been saying in the, in the previous session. So, in my English translation, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Well, firstly, it's the kingdom of heaven. Because up until John, it was about the kingdom of Israel. Yeah? So, the kingdom of Israel actually ended when the, when the prophets ended. <laughs> Yeah, then there was 400 years where there was not the kind of revelation that we have in the canon of Scripture. Yes, there were writings, but you know the apostolic fathers didn't include them in the, the canon of Scripture, um, and so there was those 400 years. John the Baptist came and he heralded not just the Messiah; he heralded the kingdom of heaven had come to earth. Do you know the, the, um, the angels who appeared in the sky to the shepherds when Jesus was born? They announced Jesus as king. Right? Luke 2.11, I think it is. To you this day is born in the city of David, which was David's birthplace, meaning in the lineage of David, uh, which we know from Scripture to be true. Uh, a deliverer. Uh, most English translations say a saviour, which then most people think it's my personal saviour. But that's not what the angels were saying. They were talking about a deliverer of God's people. Yeah. Corporately. Yeah. Uh, a deliverer. Yeah. Who is your anointed king? That's actually what the Greek says. Uh, <laughs> the English translation says, who is Christ the Lord? Christ means anointed. The word for Lord is supreme authority, which is king. Right? So a deliverer who is your anointed king. That's how Jesus was announced by the angels of heaven. Wow. <laughs> Why? Because he, he, the Father had sent him as king of the kingdom of heaven. And it's interesting what uh, Talatala Siriano just, Siriano just said about the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and it will give life. It will give birth. All right? Because if we study the, the, the Greek words in, in Matthew eleven twelve, this is kind of what it says. The kingdom of heaven is a life force. Wow. So the kingdom of heaven doesn't suffer violence in the way we think of that term. See, suffereth is a 17th century English word. It meant something different. <laughs> yeah. right? In the Greek, it actually means the kingdom of heaven is a force and the word for force comes from the word for life. Wow. 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 The kingdom of heaven is a life force. It's a force of supernatural life. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah? So this is not that we are suffering violence. In other words, we're under attack, you know, or we're on the attack. Or No, no, no. This is actually about that the kingdom of heaven is a force of supernatural life in us and in the world, through us. That changes things, doesn't it? Yeah? Now, this revelation will change us. <laughs> Right? The kingdom of heaven is not like any other kingdom. It's opposite too. Right? When Jesus talked about you know, the, the leaders of the Gentiles, but not so among you, on the contrary. In other words, opposite with you, you know, how you do things in my kingdom compared to the kingdoms of this world. Right? The kingdom of heaven is opposite to the things of the world. Yeah? And it's a life force. Wow. <laughs> and it says, and the forceful seize it. 
In other words, they are, people are so hungry right, that they want to lay a hold of it. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is how we enter into what I talked about in the last session. If we understand that because we are in the Spirit, we then live in the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we're led by the Spirit, but then the same Holy Spirit that had the power to raise Christ from the dead, it's a life force within us. It births things in us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This is what the Apostles' Doctrine does. It bursts things in us. Yeah. See, Paul said to the Corinthians, to you I'm an apostle, to others I am not. He said, I'm your apostolic father because I <coughs> begot you in the gospel. I birthed something in you through the gospel I preached. Amen. Wow. It's the birthing. Yeah. Amen. Right? You see, this weekend we can have a really nice time and go away and nothing's birthed in us. Or we can be so hungry that we will forcefully seize a hold of these things. <laughs> yeah? Amen. Yeah? And uh, do what Naomi said this morning, I think it was you, um, about, or somebody said this morning, I think, about, <laughs> might have been you, about um, Jacob not letting the angel go. I will not let you go till you bless me. Right? Forcefully seizing a hold of what God has. Yeah? But we do this with humility. It's because of hunger. It's because we want to, um, you know, let go of the things that have been and lay a hold of the things you know that are going to be a life force in and through us amen and you see so much of pentecostalism is about stress so much of the charismatic thing is about stress right i have to have a word i have to have a better sermon this week than last week <laughs> right i have to grow my church yeah? <laughs> I have to heal the sick. Yeah? It's all about I have to. And it's about stress if I don't produce the outcomes that I think I should have to. <laughs> Is this okay? Is this true? Yeah, it's true. Yeah? Man, I thank God that He delivered me from all of that. <laughs> I don't have to do anything. Mm. What I have to do is be in the Spirit. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah? Then stuff happens everywhere. Because mm. if we forcefully lay a hold of this, mm. all right? In other words, if we're so hungry that we won't let him go mm. until we've entered into it, and won't let it go until we're fully in there and can't get out of it, you know, can, can never leave it. <laughs> That's when the life force begins to manifest. Wow. Yeah? So, when, when we previously were doing School of the Kingdom at Omega Church with um, Talatala Siriana and Kalevi, one night, um, another Fijian minister who was um, attending was uh, standing in the entry of the church building and I was going out and he said, oh, man, I've had such a bad pain with my ear for three days now, you know? And I just said, put my hand up and said, be healed and kept walking. <laughs> I didn't shout at the devil. I didn't fast and pray beforehand. <laughs> you, you hear what I'm saying? No. I'm, I'm just giving a testimony here. This is not made about me being anything special. This is an example. Right? He was instantly healed. No fuss. Right? When Peter and John in Acts 3 went to, were going to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer, they were just doing what they did every day. Yeah? But they'd entered into something in the Spirit. Do you know, they had passed that lame man so many times. Yeah. They would have put money in his tin mm -hmm. so many times. Yeah. 
well, maybe it wasn't a tin, but his, his container, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> his clay pot. Yeah. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But that day, uh, they heard the voice of the Spirit. We're not giving you money today. <coughs> Going to give you what we carry. Wow. Amen. Now, let me tell you about that story. That account is not about the healing. I used to preach it was about a great healing. Right? And that we give the power of God. And all these things, you know. <laughs> that, God showed me that story is not about a healing. That story is about God's purpose which came about because of the healing. Yeah? yeah? But Peter and John were in the Spirit. And that day the Holy Spirit said, heal this man, don't put money in his container. Yeah? yeah? So you know what that healing produced? Firstly, he could function like a man again. First thing. Second thing, he could, he could function in the temple. <coughs> he was always outside before. <laughs> the healing meant he, and, and that was the first thing he did. Function like a man, he stood, he danced, he leapt, you know. <laughs> what was the, the very next thing he did? Went into the temple, engaged in spiritual life. Yeah? So he was restored in his spiritual life. He was restored as a husband. Yeah? yeah. You know, for a, a wife to have a lame husband was a shameful thing in that culture. So his dignity was restored, but his marital dignity was restored. But also he could function in every way now as a husband. Wow. Also, he could function fully as a father now. Mm. Yeah? <laughs> also, if they had farmland, he could function as a farmer now. Not a beggar. Yeah? Or if he was, you know, he could, perhaps he could now start a business that he couldn't start before. Mm. See, for all those years, his business was begging. Mm. Not a very profitable business. How do you upscale a begging business? <laughs> yeah? Wow. He's 40 years old. In 10 years' time now, he can look forward to sitting in the gate with the elders. Being a father to the city. Wow. None of that was possible before. <laughs> yeah? Because Peter and John were going about their everyday life. Going to the temple at the hour of prayer was not some spiritual thing. This was just their everyday practice. But this particular day, they heard the voice of the Spirit. Yeah. And look what it changed. Talk about a life force. It gave new life to that man, to his marriage, to his children, his whole family, to his business, to his future. Wow. That's a life force, right? Yeah? yeah? My goodness. <laughs> so the kingdom of God is a life force. Kingdom of heaven is a life force. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> it gives life. It births Amen. things. Amen. My <laughs> prayer is that so much supernatural stuff you know, the kingdom of God, the ways of God will be birthed in you this weekend that you'll never be the same again. That you'll have a different future from this, this weekend on. Yeah? <laughs> That's what the kingdom of God's like, you see. Do you know that uh, Luke actually talks about this, but a little bit differently from Matthew. Luke 16, verse 16. <laughs> He says, the law 
and the prophets were until John. So similar to Matthew, all right? We're in Luke 16, verse 16. And since that time, since what time? Since the time of the law and the prophets, right? Sorry, since the time of John, rather, right? So the law and the prophets were until John. And since the time of John, the kingdom of God has been declared. And everyone is pressing into it. Pressing is the same word as Matthew used for force. So everyone is forcing their way into it. Now, yes, because we're saved, we're in the kingdom of heaven. Right? We're in the kingdom of God. But there is but the kingdom of God is limitless. Because God is limitless. The revelation the Holy Spirit can bring to us is limitless. Yeah? So the key to life in the kingdom and the key to functioning apostolically is to continue to press in for more. To always be hungry for more in the spirit, for more in his word, for more of him, for more of his ways. Right? The ways of where God is taking us now. You know, Peter talked about this present truth. Okay? There is, there, there is a truth that God is speaking in the world now that he hasn't, didn't speak for the last generation or the generation before. It's this present truth, the, present, the truth for this time, for this season in God. This is what we must be hungry for. This is what the Apostles' Doctrine brings to us. This is what hearing the voice within the voice brings us into. And it's about the hunger and about, well, not letting go until you bless me. Not letting go, you know, forcing our way in it in the sense of we are so hungry for it, you know, that we won't let our feelings stop it. We won't let our problems stop us from entering in and functioning there, living there. Amen. But we will always be in the Spirit. We'll be hearing the voice of the Spirit in every conversation, everywhere. You know? Wow. <laughs> you know, if God can speak to a prophet through a donkey, He can speak to us through anything and anybody. <coughs> True? Amen. You know, back in the, in the 1990s, I went through a, one of the difficult seasons of life. And... Um, Uh, I, well, I was in burnout, right? Because I was, you know, Pentecostal evangelist and I had to produce certain kind of results and, you know, had to preach bigger and bigger crowds and bigger and bigger churches and, you know, all, all the stuff to be a successful evangelist, you know? And I burnt out, right? And um, I was in the heart of my town one day and my heart was, God, I just don't know what to do anymore, you know? <laughs> I had nothing. I was empty, you know. I was walking past a shop and there was a song playing. Now this might, you know, you, please don't um, react to what I'm going to say. But the singer of this song is a gay man. <laughs> a very high profile gay man. Famous worldwide, right? And it was a, a, you know, a hit song, a secular song, a worldly song being played in a secular shop, if you will. But the chorus said, I'm still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I heard the voice of God. And you might think, that can't be true. How can God speak to you through a gay man? <laughs> a non-Christian song. I've got to tell you something. If we have ears to hear, like Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Mm. What did the Apostle John say? He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Mm. The Holy Spirit can and wants to speak to us anywhere, at any time, through mm. anything. Mm. Amen. And he's, he's made a priest of him. Mm. He spoke through a donkey. Mm. Also, the Bible says he'll speak to us through babies. True? Oh, no, I, I need a great man of God to, to give, get a, give me a word. No. <laughs> We need the Holy Spirit to give us a word through whatever channel he chooses. Amen. <laughs> yeah? 
Wow. <laughs> Do you know, me hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit through that secular song written and sung by a gay man changed my life, changed that situation. I began to get healed out of that burnout. You know, I found myself every day waking up with that song in my head. Right? And you might think, well, that's wrong. You shouldn't wake, you should wake up with a worship song. No, that's our religiosity. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it is. Right? I was taught, you know you're spiritual when you wake up with worship songs in your head. I'm like, well, actually, I woke up day after day for many months with this secular song by a gay man in my head and God was speaking to me saying you're not down and out you're still standing stand up on the inside <laughs> wow <laughs> is this okay it's alright yeah you see we have so many rules and regulations in our head yes right and these rules and regulations stop us hearing the voice of the spirit they stop us from pressing into the things of the kingdom. They divide us. They set us one against the other. That's what they do. Because we're not hearing the voice of the Spirit. We're not seeing the grace on one another. You know, We're not seeing what each other carries. We're not identifying with each other in the Spirit. You know, Because of all the rules and regulations in our heads. <laughs> yeah? Do you know what the Apostle Paul had to do? He had to get all the rules and regulations of being a Pharisee out of his head. Wow. In fact, he said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was one of the elite. Do you know what happened when he first began to preach the gospel? His own wife and her family were the ones who actually tried to kill him. Because he brought the worst shame upon the elite of the Pharisees by becoming a preacher of the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so when he says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, that's not just prideful. He's talking about his life experience, that his whole mindset was set by that, you know, his whole life was geared by that. He was in the upper echelon of Jewish society. He had authority to kill people on behalf of the Pharisees. Right? <laughs> and yet, he unlearnt all of that. He forced his way more and more into the kingdom. Right? He was hungry to get rid of all of that to become the apostle that he was called to be. In all its fullness. Wow. <laughs> Amazing, eh? So everyone's pressing into it. Well, not everyone is pressing into it now. Many people are rejecting the message of the kingdom, right? Many people are rejecting the apostolic. Yeah. Many people see these things as a threat to the status quo. You know? They see it as a threat to their ministry success. Yeah? But God is not going to relent. <laughs> yeah? God will not relent. He's more committed to His kingdom being fully established on the earth, in and through His people, than we ever will be. But the key for us is to be so hungry for it that we won't stop pressing in for it. Amen? Amen. And, um, and then the greater works will come. You know, when Jesus said that you'll do greater things than these, you know, I, for many, many years, I wondered what he meant. Right? <laughs> I mean, what's greater than raising the dead? Come on. And, and I used to try and think, well, what is it that God could give me to do that could be greater than that? And I haven't raised anyone from the dead. Right? I'd like to one day. I reckon that'd be pretty good. <laughs> but there's greater works than raising someone from the dead. Wow. 
I don't know if I've told you this story, but I feel I should tell it. I was in a country many years ago, it was in the 90s actually, and this country was, was in civil war. And for the first weekend, I was doing ministry in the capital city, and I was um, uh, housed in the home of the minister of police. Okay, uh, He was a, one of the pastors of this network of churches, and... Um, and uh, they felt that that would be a safe place for me and my team to stay in the capital city. Every morning he would receive the, the military reports from the battles overnight. One morning, the report said there was 300 dead, right? just in one night. So it was a very serious situation. So we did a weekend of ministry there. Then we flew to the uh, capital city of another province which was actually the uh, headquarters of the other side of the armed conflict. Right? <laughs> so we went to enemy territory. Yeah? And it was in that city that we were having national conference for this movement of churches. <laughs> so there was about a thousand pastors and leaders from all across this nation that somehow came there even though there was this civil war going on. Right? And the, the church building had no walls except for around the stage. So just a very big roof and um, it was on top of a mountain so you could see all around. So it's on an island, um, you see the ocean, uh, down the bottom there's villages all around and of course the city as well. And um, it was five nights and four days, right? Monday night through to Friday night, this conference. We had a fantastic time. It was just really great, you know. And um, on the last night, you know, we had great worship and all of that. And then they, you know, really warmly introduced me because we'd had, we'd had such a great week. This is the climax of the week. You know, everyone's got great expectation about, you know, I'm going to preach the best message of the week. You know, all these, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> so they gave me the microphone. And when I took the microphone, the Holy Spirit said, don't speak. And I'm like, really? He said, say nothing. Now, I've got to tell you, that went totally against everything in me. Right? I mean, I'm the man, right? <laughs> you know, I'm the big man of the conference, you know. I'm the main speaker. Right? Everyone's expecting me to have a great message for the last message of the conference, yeah? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, do not speak. So I stood in front of a thousand pastors and leaders and their wives and did not open my mouth. It was very awkward. <laughs> it was awkward for me because I was having a fight with myself. Yeah, well, really, I was having a fight with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? But I knew I was not to speak. Right? Then after a few minutes, right, I just stood there. After a few minutes, one man leapt to his feet and started to roar. He, didn't, he wasn't shouting, wasn't screaming, he was roaring. Right? Then others began to get up and roar. Right? Then the whole place is on their feet and then they're actually up on the bench, standing on the benches and they're roaring. And then we could hear the host of heaven above them. I thought it might have gone on for like 15, 20 minutes. But, one, but the, the host pastor, he said it went for 40 minutes. This roar with the hosts of heaven in concert with us. And I'm standing there not saying anything for the whole time that I would have been preaching normally. <laughs> right? Do you know that because it was a civil war, people thought there was an actual battle going on on the top of the mountain. So hundreds of people ran up the mountain to see what was going on. And of course the light is spilling out over the grass because there's no walls. Right? As soon as they 
ran into the light, they would fall to the ground like they were dead men. There was hundreds of bodies around the building. Right? <laughs> the greater works. Because, you know, the next morning, knock, knock, knock on my door, and the host pastor said, Phil, have you heard the news? I said, no. He said, last night when we were roaring, he said, the generals of both sides of the war came together for a meeting and established a truce. No. Yeah? Do you know, I was a part of one of the greater works by not saying anything. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying, right? Yeah? How hungry are we to hear the voice of the Spirit and obey it? Wow, what can God do if we're, if we're sensitized to the voice of the Spirit? We, we don't just hear sermons, but we hear His voice. We don't just have conversations, but we hear God from each other, you know? We, we are in the Spirit, we live in the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we're led by the Spirit. You know, He's a life force within us. The Kingdom of God's in us, it's a life force within us and out from us, amen? Do you know, many thousands of people have died in that civil war. But it stopped that night. Wow. <laughs> Do you know that um, all the rejects from that war ended up in a community outside the capital city? And the police were too afraid to go there. The United Nations force would go in there in armoured vehicles, but often they would not get out of their armoured vehicles. Do you know who went in there without any protection? Or any arms, two pastors' wives. They went in there and began to teach the children. Yeah. They established a school of 800 kids in that place where the police were too, too afraid to go. The greater works. Because they taught the kids the ways of God. And the kids taught their parents the ways of God. <laughs> and this reject community, all the worst of the worst from the war, began to be transformed. Wow. Yeah? What could God do through each and every one of us if we, you know, actually got rid of the old way of thinking and doing and truly listened to the voice of the Spirit? Because the kingdom of heaven is a life force. Wow, a life force. And our hunger must be such that it is a force causing us to press in for more and more of this. Amen? <laughs> yeah? So that we lay a hold of the things of the Spirit. Our minds are set on the things of the Spirit. You know? Our thoughts are on the things of the Spirit because we are in the Spirit. Yes, we deal with the things of the natural and whatever, but this is why the Apostle Paul said, pray without ceasing. You see, you can't pray without ceasing with your mind. Yeah? Because if you're counselling someone, <laughs> you know, you're thinking, oh, hello. It's died. If you're counselling someone, then... Our, our minds are engaged as well as our hearts. Is that right? If you're at work, you're thinking about the things you've got to think about. Yeah? And yet Paul said, pray without ceasing. That's about our spirit communicating with the Holy Spirit constantly. Yeah? Constantly. Because we are in the Spirit. He's in us. Therefore, we live in Him. We don't go back to the out, away from Him. Right? We are in Him. We live in Him. We walk in Him. We're led by Him. He's a life force within us. His kingdom's in us. It's a life force within us. And if we, if we are sensitized to the voice of the Spirit and our spirit is communicating with the Holy Spirit 24-7, then God's going to interrupt our thoughts. <laughs> yep. Yeah? 
we must expect that the Holy Spirit will interrupt our thoughts. Yeah? And we must actually do what he interrupts for. Because <laughs> the interruption is more important than anything else. It's a, a, an intervention by heaven. Yeah? That's what it is. And it produces life. It produces supernatural outcomes. It produces the exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. Yeah? Wow. I'm going to tell you another story. Uh, you know, ministered in Russia uh, many times. We established a bunch of church planting schools in Western Russia and also in the Ukraine. Uh, this was in the late 90s and early 2000s. So in the city of Yulianovsk, I was working with a, um, a great man of God, ex-military. He, he was a military major. Um, he'd uh, you know, fought wars and so on in Azerbaijan and other places. And um, God told him to go home and start a church amongst his family and friends. So he did. And um, an Australian missionary in Estonia uh, was actually sending people into Russia to plant churches. And... Um, uh, and he planted. He, he went and helped this guy to, to start a church. Um, but then he, he was like, well, God, I need somebody else. This work is too big. And God spoke to him to call me. So I'm in Australia. And this missionary in Estonia calls me from there, from the city of Tallinn. And he explains the situation and he says, will you come to Russia? What he did not know is God had already put it in my heart to go to Russia. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, Leon, that's better, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so God had already put it in my heart to go to Russia, and now the invitation came, so I just said yes. He said, don't you want to pray about it? I said, I don't need to. <laughs> no, God had already spoken to me. Yeah? See, knowing the will of God's easy if we are healing. Yeah? So then... I took a, a ministry friend of mine with me, and so the next year we went to Russia, flew into Moscow, then flew to the city of Yulianovsk, which is the birth city of Lenin, you know, the leader of the communist revolution. And uh, met this pastor, did a week of training for uh, his church and another church in that city that wanted to come together with us. You know, when I was flying into that city, I knew nothing about the city, I had not researched it. I do tend to research places more now. <laughs> um, but I got this vision of a fire starting there uh, and growing bigger than it, it, than it jumping and a small fire starting and growing bigger somewhere else and then jumping to another city, another city, another city. Yeah. Right? And um, so at the end of the week of ministry and whatever, I, I shared this vision with them and they all got very excited. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's a great vision, but I didn't think they'd get that excited. But then they told me that the vision I'd had was actually the vision that Lenin had for the communist revolution. <laughs> and he called his communist newspaper the Spark. Right? To spark fires in every city to do with communism. Right? And so I knew what God was saying. He wanted to do the same for the kingdom of God. Right. Same principle, but the kingdom of heaven. Right. So, went back a few times to this city, and we saw many churches planted in that part of Russia. But you know, in, in Russia, during the communist times, the only places that people could gather was in Communist Party headquarters, or in the nightclubs for the Communist Party elite. Right. Apart from the communist elite, nobody could gather. Right? So all the churches um, were meeting in homes. So this particular church, it now met in six homes. Right? <laughs> because they had no place to all meet together. But when I say they met in a home, it would be 40, 50 people in a home. And they had six homes like that. So I just had a burden for them to have a place where they could gather all together. Because the only way they could do it was to go outside the city into a field. And if you 
If you understand Russia, that's not a good thing in winter. Right? I've been in, the coldest I've been in is minus 22, and it's very hard to breathe. Right? <laughs> it's painful to breathe, right? because it's so cold. So it's not ideal to meet out in the fields, particularly in winter. I had this burden for them to have their, a place to meet all together. So I ran out of money, as in cash, but I had Australian dollars. And, um, but the banks would not uh, change my Australian dollars into Russian rubles because we have plastic money. Right? They didn't think it was real. <laughs> so we're driving down a road, the street in the you know, main part of the city, and I saw a big man dressed all in black standing in a doorway, and the Holy Spirit said, talk to him. I said, you're a pullover now. He said, what for? I said, <laughs> just pull over. So he pulled over. I said, I have to talk to that man back there. He said, oh, no, you can't talk to that man. I said, yes, I'm going to talk to that man. <laughs> so I, I got out of the car. Now he's panicking, right? I didn't know who the man was. Right? All I knew was the Holy Spirit said, talk to that man. <laughs> so I'm walking back along the footpath, and, and Yura's running and calling out to me, and he's saying, you cannot talk to that man. I said, Yura, be my translator. I'm going to talk to this man. Right? So I walked up, and I reached out my hand, and of course, instinctively, people respond, right? Shook his hand. And I said, my name's Phil Spence, I'm from Australia, you know, and Euro translated. And, um, and out of my mouth came, um, I have Australian dollars, can you change them into rubles? <laughs> this is crazy, right? Who would do such a thing? When this man heard the translation from Euro, he looked me up and down, you know. I think he was trying to figure out, you know, what was going on. But then he said, wait a minute. And he went inside. Right? Then he came back and he said, come in. So we went inside and um, the owner of the building was there. <laughs> this man is the mafia boss for that city and state. <laughs> I'm in this building and I'm asking for a very important thing. Please change my money. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, again, he's looking me up and down, you know, like, is this man for real? What's going on? Because the mafia is suspicious, right? Who's this foreigner who is using you know, this thing of asking for me to change his Australian dollars, what's his real agenda? You know, that's what he's thinking. In the end, he said, okay, uh, I'll give you this rate. And it was a very good rate. So I said, okay, let's do it. So I pulled my money out, gave it to him. He went into his office. He came back with, you know, the right number of rubles. And uh, then I said, so what kind of business do you do here? He said, oh, we run a nightclub here. I'm like, oh, I've never seen a Russian nightclub. Can I have a look? <laughs> so the man at the door, he was the bouncer, right? He's the security. He does not let anybody in. And yet, he went and talked to the owner, and I got to speak to the big man himself. <laughs> right? God will use anybody, right? Even the head of the mafia. So then... We go down and we see this, this uh, nightclub. Massive stage on one side, big light show, huge PA system, big dance floor. Then on this side, there's tiered seating. It goes up, 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 up. And it has curved seating with, with tables. Up, 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 all the way up. So hundreds of people can be in there, right? And he's very proudly telling me that he has the, the top nightclub in the city. Right. And um, so I'm appreciating this place because it was actually something special, you know. Then I said to him, is it available on Sunday morning? He said, oh no, the, the cleaners are in here Sunday morning. Because we finish at 4 o'clock Sunday morning, so then after that the cleaners take a few hours to clean up. 
I said, um, would they, could they be finished by 10 o'clock? And he's like, well, why are you asking? I said, well, this man is the pastor of a church and his church needs somewhere to meet that is bigger than home. Right? I would like his church to be able to meet here every Sunday at 10 o'clock. This man said, uh, well, I guess our cleaners could be finished before then. Right? And, and like, you're the pastor. Well, our expression is he was dying a thousand deaths. Because right? he knows who this man is, but I don't. <laughs> right? To me, he's just the owner of a nightclub. <laughs> so then he, he doesn't think we're serious right? he thinks this is all a joke and he actually said to you right, which one of my friends put you up to this right? in other words which one of my friends sent you and your foreign friend here to come and play this joke on me <laughs> and I said no we're serious right? we want to hire your nightclub at 10am every Sunday for a church service. Totally unheard of, right? He said yes. And he gave it to us at a very reasonable price. Okay? So then we go back down this hallway to the entry area, and there's all these doors along the hallway. So I said, what are all these rooms? He said, oh, you know, people uh, rent them for offices and all that kind of thing. And, and I said, so are they all taken? He said, oh, no, this one here, you know, the closest to the entry, he said, it, it's available. I said, well, would you throw that in for no extra money? <laughs> he, he looked at me like with a, a look of disbelief, right? Because he's the mafia boss for that state. And here's this foreigner who's, you know, negotiating very heavily with him, <laughs> right? <laughs> on behalf of the local pastor, right, to get what we need. In the end, he said, ah, yes, you can have it. So we got the nightclub Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, every Sunday. We got this big room for office and prayer room for nothing. Right? <laughs> yeah? Are you hearing something this morning? Yes. All right? All because I heard the Holy Spirit say, talk to that man. Yeah? So, we, we can be a Pharisee of the Pharisees or we can be apostolic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> yeah. We can do things the way we were taught or we can do things the way of the Spirit. But the greater works come by the leading of the Holy Spirit. The greater outcomes. Amen? Let's, um, let's go to Matthew 13 and verse 52. Matthew chapter 13. I'm trying to go there on my digital phone. Matthew 13, verse 52. Jesus said to them, and uh, by the way, he's, um, um, you know, he's talking uh, about parables, right? So he's, he's in the middle of teaching a bunch of parables. And um, then he says, therefore, now verse 51, have you understood these things? Right? Because he told the parable of the sower, then he explained it to the twelve. Because they said, oh, what are you teaching parables for? The people don't understand them. What they really meant is, we don't understand them. <laughs> right? Yeah, they didn't understand them. So Jesus explained the parable of the sower to teach them how to understand the parables. And then he taught some more, and then he says, have you understood these things? In other words, have you heard the voice behind the voice? Yeah? Have you heard the voice of the Spirit in these teachings I'm giving? That's what Jesus was saying to them. Right? Then he said, Therefore, so on the basis of having now understood, being able to hear the voice of the Spirit in what Jesus was saying, therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven 
is like a householder who brings out of his treasure new and old. All right? So every scribe, why did Jesus now talk about the scribes? Well, the scribes were the most learned people in Israel. You see, they didn't have printers back in those days. They did not have photocopiers. They did not have scanners. Okay? The way they made, and you probably know this, the way they made new copies of the scriptures was that they would write a, a new scroll by hand. So have one scroll of the scripture here, have a blank scroll here, and copy. So the scribes did this day after day after day. They knew the scriptures better than anybody. Yeah? <laughs> And what did Jesus say? Every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven. It actually means every scribe who wants to become a pupil of the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what Jesus is saying? With all of the scribes learning, they've got to start again to be a pupil of the kingdom of heaven. Wow. <laughs> now the scribes did not want to do that. But Jesus was making a point to his disciples. It didn't matter what they'd been taught. Now they needed to be retaught. They needed to hear from the Spirit. Yeah? And, um, and then they would be like a householder, in other words, one in charge of a house or an overseer who brings out of his treasure so then we have a treasure. We don't just have knowledge, we have a treasure. Wow. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? We all have a lot of knowledge, but do we have a treasure? Mm. Uh, but if we become a pupil of the kingdom, which takes humility, right? Mm. What Jesus was suggesting was humiliating to the scribes. He was humiliating them by suggesting that with all of their knowledge, they should start again like a child, like a pupil, to learn about his kingdom. He was insulting them. <laughs> but he told them what would happen if they did do it. They would then carry a treasure. Paul talked about it as a treasure in earthen vessels. Yeah? And it would be new and old. So there's foundation that never changes, right? It's foundation we've learnt that never changes. But there is new things that God wants to build on the foundation. Amen? And... Um, <clears throat> oh, I haven't got it here. Do you know, Jesus, uh, at one point in Luke, I think it was Luke 24, it says that he, he opened the minds of the disciples that they might comprehend the Scriptures. See, they knew the Scriptures. Yeah? See, the Jews, they, they actually memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. Yeah? They know the scriptures. But what was going on was that Jesus said, you know the scriptures, but you don't understand them. Wow. Just like with the ferret, with the scribes, you're the most learned in all of Israel, but you don't know my kingdom. Wow. But what Jesus did was he opened their minds so they understood. They received revelation. Wow. So that meant that some of the foundation that they'd been taught would remain, but a lot of other stuff, you know, the Jewish ceremonial stuff and all of those things, you know, would have to go because now they were having to come into the new of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah? And, um, and, and this was so necessary for them to be able to advance the kingdom across the world. Otherwise, they would have advance the kingdom from a Jewish perspective, not from a perspective of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? And the challenge for, for me, I guess for us, is that we need our minds opened. Yeah? Yeah. To actually comprehend, to understand the things of the Spirit. Do you know, when Paul went to uh, Philippi, he found a, a, a woman called Lydia, a dealer in purple, which meant she was um, a businesswoman, but she 
um, she had influence and her business was amongst the elite or the upper echelon of society. Now she came from Thyatira, which is another city, so she had uh, influence not just in, in Philippi, but over the region. Okay? So this woman's very influential. She knows some things, right? <laughs> she knows business. She knows important people. She knows how to deal with finances. She knows how to make a profit. You know, she knows how to conduct herself in the upper echelons of society. She knows a lot of stuff. But the Bible says that, that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. See, she heard the Holy Spirit in what Paul was saying, and she then acted on it. That's what it means. Wow. Interesting, eh? Hey? This is how the church at Philippi was birthed, was that Paul was you know, teaching about the kingdom, and God opened her heart to not just hear, but to pay attention, and then to take action. Wow. <laughs> this is what God's doing all over again. Amen? Yeah. Is He's wanting us to be able to have our minds and our hearts opened so we can hear, so we can see in the realm of the Spirit, so that we can be praying without ceasing, our spirits communing and, and hearing from the Holy Spirit continually. He can break into our thinking and we stop and take notice and act on it, you know? Um, we speak or we don't speak. We do or we don't do whatever the Holy Spirit says. And then we accomplish the greater works. Yeah? Amazing, hey? All right? So I want to pray now that the Holy Spirit will open our minds and our hearts. Like never before. Amen? Is that your desire? Are you hungry for that? Do you have a force inside you wanting you to press into that? <laughs> Yeah, because if this is how our hearts are, then we are going to enter into a life force that will mean that we will live and function in the spirit, not out of the natural mind. Yeah, And God will then be able to do the greater works through our lives. Wow. Amen.